The great-grandparents of the potatoes you will buy seven years or more from now may be here, a thousand feet up in the Scottish hills. These small families of potato plants have been bred for their freedom from disease. They'll be allowed to multiply over these seven years or more until they yield enough tubers to pass on to a commercial seed potato grower. Only then, after at least another year of multiplication, will they go to growers who sell for market. The high quality seed for the next season's planting can be delivered to the farmer any time from the previous autumn onward. He'll need to make sure that the seed is dry and that it's up to specification. Then he'll need to store it until the spring. So he'll take the trouble to sort out the odd damaged or diseased potato so that infection can't spread. On many farms, like this one, the seed potatoes will be stored in trays so that they're all exposed to light and warmth equally. The farmer not only has to invest in storage space, but he has to control the temperature and humidity of his store. And he may even have to use artificial lighting to help sturdy sprout development. Whatever the kind of seed store he uses, his aim is to get his seed potatoes to the point where they're ready to plant early in the spring. It's here that he has to make his next investment, a planter. Good farm labor is in short supply, and so is good planting weather. So to make the best use of the limited time available, the farmer must mechanize. The planter not only plants the seed potatoes evenly, but it adds fertilizer, and it builds up the rows neatly above and around the seed. The farmer plants the right variety of seed, both for his land and for you, his customer. No amount of careful husbandry will help him if he isn't planting an acceptable variety. During the growing season, he will need to spray his crop to keep down weeds and to prevent... If his farm is in that part of Britain which doesn't have enough rain, he'll need to irrigate. Potatoes need plenty of water in their growing season. It's in the autumn, when the farmer lifts his crop, that he finds out how successful his efforts have been. And he uses another vital machine, a harvester, to gather his crop safely before winter sets in. It's during lifting and getting his crop into store that the farmer stands most chance of damaging his potatoes. Unfortunately, the machines can't handle potatoes as if they were eggs, but they do an essential job of lifting the six million tons required to meet the national need, because each of us eats over 200 pounds of potatoes every year. There's one problem always with the farmer, the weather. In a really wet autumn, he may be forced to lift in bad conditions he runs the risk of clogging his machines with clods of soil and stems. Even when he lifts his potatoes, they can be too wet to store. Even though he can negotiate the road, he can find it impossible to turn his weighty harvester on the headland. Not that farmers aren't used to mud. It's an occupational hazard. And it can even affect busment holidays like the harvester demonstrations. These take place every two years and are organized by the Potato Marketing Board. The board's purpose is to help farmers gain a better crop to pass on to you, the consumer. Demonstrations are the potato farmer's equivalent to window shopping. He can see the latest handling and harvesting equipment working side by side and make comparisons. Each farmer is his own judge, deciding which machines will do best on his land and in his conditions. The whole demonstration keeps him up to date and able to meet the demand for more and better potatoes on your plate.
back on the farm, the grower has lifted his crop, and he can now do one of two things. Sell it immediately, or store it for sale later. The majority of regular growers must store at least part of their crop. The elevator moves the potatoes into store and may sort out some of the soil, stones, and smaller potatoes. There's no point in storing if you don't store well. This means yet another investment in a potato store. The traditional method of storing for many years was the clamp, a large outdoor mound of potatoes covered with straw and earth. It can still keep a good crop well enough. A more modern variant is the Dicky Pie, named after a Mr. Dicky, by the way, which is altogether larger and can even have, as here, part size of concrete and ventilation underneath. But the large-scale grower will almost certainly invest in an indoor store, quite possibly purpose-built and with sophisticated techniques of controlling the conditions inside. These stores should keep potatoes in good condition till early summer. The potatoes are stored either in bulk or in pallet boxes. Research into storage is centered on the board's own station at Sutton Bridge in Lincolnshire, set up in the 1960s. Already, the optimum physical environment for storage has been clearly established. And this means the assurance of better quality potatoes in your shops at the end of the old potato season. When the farmer judges the time is right for the market, he opens his store to grade and sell his crop. Grading, basically, is taking out potatoes which aren't up to the standards set by the board. They may be too large or too small. They may have been damaged mechanically or have contracted a bacterial disease while in store. Potatoes are sensitive. They bruise and damage easily. Remember that even though they're out of the ground, the tubers are still alive. Given plenty of warmth, they'll sprout, as any housewife knows. Grading, too, means another substantial expense for the farmer, not only in machinery investment, but in the people he needs to employ. In grading, there is as yet no substitute for the human eye. Centralized grading and marketing is now a rapidly developing feature of the industry. Groups of farmers are getting together to establish their own grading stations. It makes a lot of commercial sense. It spreads the necessary investment in expensive grading plants. Instead of relying on uncertain occasional labor, the grading stations can employ their staff all the year round. They can grade new potatoes as well as main crops. And in the slack period of early summer, can even switch to packing potatoes bought in from other farms. The existence and expansion of such stations is a guarantee to the consumer of reliable, consistently graded products. The stations may market under their own name or serve some of the larger supermarkets direct. Grading is their livelihood, and they know that good grading brings repeat orders. Another advantage is that grading stations can find markets for a much wider range of products. Factory canteens, for example, need potatoes ready peeled and even chipped. There's a growing market too for dehydrated potatoes, frozen chips, canned potatoes. Indeed, almost one-fifth of this country's crops is now consumed by the public in a processed form. The grading stations are ideally equipped to meet our ever-changing requirements. Because they handle in bulk, the stations need to make a big investment in automatic handling equipment. And here the board can help again. Their Sutton Bridge research station has also been a pioneer in the test grading and marketing of potatoes. This has meant a lot of research into the best machinery and layout for automatic handling and packing. This automatic weighing installation is one of the latest and most efficient to be put online.
The girls are there simply to adjust final weight and seal the bag. The machine itself can be set to a wide range of bag weights and is always ready to reject the underweight bag which manages to slip through the rest of the system. So finally, the farmer can market his crop. Potatoes still have to pass through quite a few hands before they reach the consumer. And every time they're moved, there's always a chance of handling damage being caused. So the farmer isn't always the person to blame if you're unhappy with the standard of what you're buying. And that's why inspectors from the board regularly visit wholesale markets and merchants' premises to check on the grading of sample bags. Each bag is numbered, and the number on the bag, should it be below standard, will lead the inspector right back to the grader. A whole load can be returned for regrading. But the vast majority of potatoes should reach you in the same good condition as they leave the farm. Whether you buy them from the farmer himself, or from your milkman, from any of your preferred shops or stores. If you think you've bought potatoes which are below standard, complain to your retailer. He too can call in an inspector from the board. They regularly visit retail outlets up and down the country and can trace any and every batch of potatoes sold over the shop counter back to the place where it was graded. In his sorting, the inspector will be looking at the size of the tubers as well as their condition. The whole system of inspection is designed to provide the consumer with a high and uniform standard of product. A uniform standard doesn't mean that potatoes are all the same, far from it. There are literally dozens of varieties. Increasingly, they're being sold by name. White varieties include Majestic, the traditional white. Maris Piper, one of the earliest of the main crop varieties. Pentland Crown, now widely available in England. Pentland Dell, similar to Crown, a good baker. Pentland Ivory, a newer variety and a good all-rounder. Then come the old favourites, King Edward in England and Wales, and Golden Wonder in Scotland. Pink skin varieties include red skin, popular in the north, lemon fleshed. And Desiree, another good all-rounder which keeps especially well. But don't forget, varieties vary even from field to field on the same farm, though the variety name is still a useful guide to its cooking quality. With all varieties, store them in a cool, dark place and only bring them into the kitchen for preparation. Peel them as thinly as possible. This preserves vitamin C. And don't worry about surface blemishes, like scab, which peeling can easily remove. When cooking them in water, always add salt. Lemon juice can help avoid blackening. To keep them whole and to maintain their valuable vitamin C, never overboil, either simmer or steam. Are potatoes fattening? Lunchtime. One slim man, one fatter man. Let's see what they order. I'll commence with the soup. The one followed by the steak, medium rare. Thank you very much. And for me, the um, question is, well, the plumper man clearly realizes he has a weight problem. What are the relative calorie counts? Thin man soup, 125 calories. Fatter man's savoury pancake, 175 calories. Perhaps he'll atone later on. 
The main course. The thinner man has steak at 550 calories, green vegetables at 30 calories, and potatoes, very nutritious in their jackets, at 200 calories. The fatter man's chicken, though, comes in pastry with a deliciously rich white wine and cream sauce. Total calories of main course with the same green vegetables, 1,080 calories. And that's without potatoes, so where's the savings? Now for the last course. Perhaps the fatter man will decline. Wrong again. Calories of fruit salad, 70. Calories of rose on toast, 150. Total for the entire meal, thin man, 975 calories. Fatter man, 1,405 calories. And that's excluding wine and coffee. Fat he is, and fat he will remain. It's no use avoiding potatoes if you more than compensate elsewhere. He's eaten an entire slimmer's allowance for the day in one meal. Different kinds of cooked potatoes have different calorie values. Mashed with milk and butter, potatoes rate 34 calories per ounce. But baked potatoes only rate 24 calories. The butter, of course, adds to the calories, but adds even more to the pleasure of eating. Thin-cut chips have twice the calories of an equal weight of thick-cut chips, because they carry more oil or fat. Boiled potatoes have only 23 calories per ounce, so there's no need to spare the parsley. Roast, like chips, depend on their size for calorie value. Small roast potatoes have twice the calories of large roast. These are all familiar, but let's see how simply some special potato dishes can be prepared. First, duchesne based on potatoes mashed with butter and an egg. Really, very straightforward. Beat the egg well into the mashed potato. Then transfer the mixture into a piping bag. Piping the potatoes out onto a baking tray gives them the attractive shape and appearance of duchesne. Bake in a moderate oven, 375 degrees Fahrenheit for 25 minutes. And before serving, sprinkle with paprika. And garnish with a touch of parsley. Now they look as good as they taste. Croquette potatoes also starts with mashed. Only this time the mash is first rolled in flour into thick fingers. Then the fingers are brushed with beaten egg. Covered in breadcrumbs, the croquettes are deep fried in hot oil or fat. This only takes a few minutes. When they're golden brown, they're ready for garnishing and serve. Croquette potatoes. So easy, yet so different. Rosti is a recipe from Switzerland. The basis this time is boiled potatoes, but they must be firm enough to slice. Then the slices are placed in a large frying pan with a little melted butter in the bottom. The slices are built up in layers. About three layers is ideal. And after every layer, salt and pepper should be added. Onions, too, if you like. Compress with a spatula, either wooden or metal, and then place on your cooker on a very low setting and leave for about 30 minutes. Turn the contents out, golden brown rosti potatoes. Research into new varieties of potatoes goes on continually. The perfect potato is still to be found. New varieties are bred and evaluated every year. For yield, 
for resistance to the normal run of potato diseases. And to make sure that the results really are right, the growing tests take place all over Britain in a wide range of soils and weather. Laboratory tests help establish the character of the new varieties. The dry matter content is judged. A high reading suggests a higher content of dry matter and a more floury potato which could be good for boiling. A lower reading suggests a firmer potato which could make good chips, for example. The new varieties are also tested for their discoloration when left exposed to the air. Their potential for crisping is assessed too. The variety in top left seems to have responded rather too enthusiastically. The pick of any year's new varieties will also be tested for their cooking quality. Here, five new ones are being assessed in relation to a known and proven variety or condition, and then served to a panel of research workers. But like all of us, potato eating. Each panelist will sample each variety. The pests are as objective as possible. They're trying to assess qualities like texture, disintegration during cooking, and discoloration. Are the potatoes moist or dry? If bitter, they will fail. Each sample is rated for performance in a range of qualities. Then the markings will be collated and compared with the ratings given for the standard variety ended in the test. A variety to go forward for further development must score well. It's no use having one which yields well if its taste isn't very nice. But in whatever form, potatoes are one of our basic foods. They're versatile. They're full of nutritional value. And they're still one of our least expensive foods. The range of potato dishes and products provides something good to eat at any time. Potatoes make the meal. So remember the effort and expense that goes into growing them. Remember the research which aims to give you an even better product in the years to come. And remember, potatoes, please.